Hello, and welcome to Ask Authors Anything, the YA Q&A web series devoted to famous writers, favorite books, and fangirling. Yay! We've already been doing a lot of that behind the scenes today. Um, I'm Megan McCafferty, and I am so proud to say that I love reading, writing, and talking about books for young people, which is why I started this show. And it's especially great in this case because it's provided me with the opportunity to finally connect with my latest guest, who I've never met in person, which is just totally ridiculous because I'm such a big fan of her work. Um, she is the author of five, well, five and a half, we will say five and a half. Uh, young adult novels, including Just One Day, which maybe you can't see that, and Just One Year. Look at that. It's a sexy cover, everybody. I like that. Yeah. And um, it's uh, the e novella Just One Night, um, which are simultaneously the most romantic yet realistic books about first love that I've read in a very long time. I totally binge read them uh, just over the past week or so. She's perhaps best known for If I Stay, which I don't have a copy of because I always give my favorite books away to people, um, and its companion novel, Where She Went, both of which were international blockbusters. In fact, um, If I Stay came out in 2009, and five years later, it is currently sitting at number five at New on the New York Times bestsellers list. Um, and not because it's just, not only because it's a gorgeous book about life, and death and love and family and friendship and all those important things. Um, but because it is hitting the big screen on August 22nd, mark your calendars, August 22nd, in a film starring, I don't know, I think she's the most interesting young actress around today, Chloe Grace Moretz. Um, anyway, I, I could go on and on. We are so lucky that she made time for us today. Please welcome the one and only Gail Foreman. And for the first and special the guest Gigi. Oh, and special guest <laughs> Black Cat Gigi to just make this Friday the thirteenth full moon freakiness just yes. complete. We're gonna um, break some years. Yeah. We are. Um and for the first but definitely not the last time, we are joined by my co hosts from my high school alma mater. Central Regional High School in Bayville, New Jersey. Yay! Central! Go Golden Eagles! Woo! Okay, that's like that. I'll get. Um, so you'll have um, opportunities to ask Gail questions as as well as anybody who is watching. Please submit questions um, while we're uh, talking live. But as always, I have to have my opportunity to fan girl first. Um, so, Gail, again, thank you so much for joining me today. It is ridiculous we've never met. I think after this conversation is over, we've got to make a date to get together. Um, but I'm so happy that I invited you and you said yes. So, um, I have met because I have come to some of your events before, but I think I was too shy of a fangirl of you to do anything no, except to turn my little book up not. and get it signed. I've been to a bunch of your events, like back at the old Columbus Circle Borders. Oh my God! You didn't come up to me, did you? Oh, I, I didn't introduce yeah. myself or anything, but I just sort of had my book signed. Like you, I'm a huge fan, so I was okay. like, "Hi." Oh boy. Okay. Well, now I'm in. Now I'm blushing. I'm all hot. I'm getting all sweaty over here. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> so, um, one of your Facebook fans, Bea Tejano, on Facebook, pointed out that music plays such an important role in your books, especially if I stay and where she went. So considering that we were supposed to hang out a few weeks ago back at Book Expo at Forever YA's karaoke night, yeah, I have a very, very important question to ask you, which is, okay. what is your go-to karaoke number? I always pick karaoke numbers that are really ambitious, and it's always a mistake. So I'm like, oh, I love, like, To Sir With Love. I should do that song. And then I get there, and it's like, hey, it gets to the high point, and I can't sing it, and I'm also tone deaf. So there's always that problem. But I have to say, one of the songs that I always love to do, which is weird because it's not a song that I love, but I love doing it, karaoke, is Sister Christian. Oh, that's a great, that's an awesome right. karaoke song. That's an amazing karaoke song. All the time. I mean, it's very, like, you can you can get the feels in that song. Okay. So wait, I was like, and also the videos that they have for that one are so delightfully cheesy. I love it. Oh, 
Oh, I love it. Okay, right, just do a little motor in. What? what? Yeah. So what about you? What's your tonight? All right. We didn't rehearse that, everybody. I know you're like, how That's did they do That's natural talent right that there. That for me was so incredible. They must have rehearsed yeah. that. No. Yeah. No, that's the magic. I know. I feel like we could sing karaoke. Don't do karaoke professionally for a living. Shocking. It's silly. It's silly. Um, I feel like we could probably talk or talk about karaoke or sing karaoke for the rest of our time. But I feel an obligation to move on to some questions. Yeah. Um, so we share more than a love of karaoke, believe it or not. Um, we have a very, we have a common background, as we were saying earlier. Um, we both got our start writing for teen and women's magazines like Seventeen, Glamour, and Cosmo. Although when I was writing for those magazines, I wrote articles like "Don't make these makeout mistakes," and um, you were writing articles, you're reporting on heavy topics like child soldiers and Sierra Leone. Um, so well, yes, one, of my, one of my favorite articles from Seventeen was seven, 75 Reasons Why Life Without a Boyfriend Rocks. Okay, all right, okay. So you did that too. You can't yeah. work for a And the quizzes, the quizzes, yeah, yeah. Oh, quizzes, I was a quiz, I was like the quiz person too. Oh, yeah. boy, we have something to talk about. But Amanda from Central has a question about your start as a novelist. Hit it, Amanda. So what inspired you to make the switch from writing nonfiction to becoming an author of fiction? What inspired me? Um, it's kind of a weird thing, but it was, it was poverty. Um, and this is sort of not exactly why you want to become a novelist, to get your way out of <laughs> but what happened was is that I had been a journalist for a dozen years and I never really thought that I would write a novel because it seemed like unlike with magazine articles where you have interviews and facts and word counts, you have these nice, nice neat parameters, I thought that when you could choose from anything, like how could you ever pick anything to write about? But, um, but what happened was I went traveling around the world for a year and I wrote a nonfiction book and then I came home and I had a baby and I couldn't travel anymore and I didn't want to travel anymore and my husband and I bought this apartment and then there turned out to be this tax it was like five hundred dollars more than we so we couldn't even afford the apartment we moved into and then I also had a bunch of magazine articles killed which is where the editors were like never mind we don't want it and we'll pay you thirty percent or maybe we'll pay you nothing so I was freaking out and um, I was talking to some people and said do you have anything any ghostwriting and somebody said to me um, well I do have this one thing it's YA but you'd be better off writing your own. And it was like this light bulb went on. And I thought of this one article I'd written at 17. It was one of my first articles there about this behavior modification, these boot camps where kids were sent. Um, and they were like worse than prisons. And the infractions they were sent for were, you know, for being defiant or for sometimes for being fat or for being gay. And it had bothered me over the years. And so I, I, I wrote my first YA novel um, about that. And when I wrote it, it was like a homecoming because I had been writing for and about young people for so long and I realized that this is what I wanted to do. And I've never looked back. Like I, I've always known from then on that writing young adult novels is what I meant to do. I'm curious to, um, to how your experience as a reporter might influence your approach to writing fiction which actually ties into a question that, that Chelsea has. Chelsea? Hey, um, I have two, two questions, actually. Um, I wanted to know what inspired you as an author. What is, it, it's different things that inspire me, and um, it's a really interesting question, Chelsea, because I think every author has like this sort of magic combination of what inspires a novel or, or what what gets a novel sort of from this idea that's spinning around in your head to something that you actually want to sit down and start start writing so um, I think there's always something that's sort of going on in my life or there's a premise I, I there's usually like a what-if scenario so with if I stay like the what-if scenario was you know what if something catastrophic happened to your family and you were somehow aware what had happened and we're hovering between life and death and you could choose what would you do. And that had been sort of hovering around in my mind um, because I'm a sick individual 
for, for several, several years, but it didn't become a novel until the character of Mia arrived fully formed in my head. And that was that moment of inspiration. Um, with where she went, I had no intention of, of writing a second book, but the characters kept waking me up in the middle of the night as I was writing this whole other novel, which is one of the novels that is now sitting on my hard drive um, and will never be published. Um, and they kept waking me up in the middle of the night, and I started thinking about where I left them, and I kind of skipped ahead, and that's what inspired that novel. Um, and then one last thing that I'll say is, I, I don't know if this is true for, for you, Megan, but for me, I always, I never quite know what a novel's really about, like what part of me it's about until I finished it. I think some authors, I know Sarah Destin talks about how she is a YA writer because high school was terrible for her, and it's a way to kind of go back. For me, high school wasn't so bad. It was elementary and middle school that were that were horrific. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of find that really, it's usually the stuff I'm going through now, as sort of a middle-aged lady, that I'm working through in the books. And, and half the time, I don't even know what it is until I've finished. So mm -hmm. it's really inspired by what I'm going through in my life. Well, while we're on the subject of inspiration, um, let's get a question specifically about If I Stay from Anna. Oh, Emmy. Emmy, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Right. myself. All right. All right, Emmy. What you got? Um, was the accident in the story inspired by a traumatizing event that you either witnessed or experienced? It was. It was not one that I witnessed or personally experienced, but it was an accident that killed friends of mine. Um, it was a family of four, and it was very much, um, you know, the... the the family was sort of a lot like the family in If I Stay. And they had all, by the time we got the news, the entire family had died. But I did hear that, that one of the kids had lived longer and had been medevaced um, to a trauma center. And that that was that piece, that, that, that what if question that I just mentioned, that's where that came from. I'm not really so morbid on my own, but I always wondered if, if that little boy knew what had happened to the rest of his family and did he choose to go with them. And I never thought I would write a novel about it uh, because at that point I never thought I'd write a novel. But you know, eight years later, the character of Mia just came into my head out of the blue and um, it was, I was going to answer that question as it pertained to her. I, I think that the, the, you know, If I Stay has resonated with so many readers. Because um, I think that the power of the story is that it, Mia's experience is it's so intimate and personal and yet it's so universal because we all grapple with questions of mortality and what happens to us or our loved ones after they die. Um, so let, I want to dig a little bit deeper about If I Stay with questions from Stephanie and Allison. Hi, I'm <laughs> Stephanie. Um, what made you uh, create the conflict between life and death? And Allison, uh, add your question right now. Oh, I'm, I'm just curious as to how like, uh, your personal spiritual beliefs are reflected in the novel. If my spiritual beliefs are what? Are how they're like, reflected in the novel. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, I think, yeah, you know, Mia's really not sure what's, what's, what's going on. And she's not, and I think that that does reflect my, my spiritual beliefs in terms of like, I, I just, I don't know. Um, I think it could be any one of things and it's a very comforting idea. You know, Mia talks about how she keeps going back and forth, like her grand thinks that there are people, um, you know, that, that, that birds are the, the spirits of people and, and this person represents that, that dead person, which is like a really comforting way to be, to think that all of our loved ones are around us. And, and Mia wishes it were the case, but she's wondering if that is the case. Where where are her parents now? Why why aren't they here? And there is no there is no clear answer because I think that it's not something any of us ever really do get to answer in our life. But it, it is a mystery and it remains a mystery. And there's something hopeful to me in the fact that 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 mystery does exist. That that we don't know, but that um, you do you do feel the questions. So yes, that that does sort of reflect. And the other one in terms of what it was inspiration or... It was about just um, 
what the what drew you to write about the conflict? So the, the, yeah, so the, the life and death conflict. It was really just what the whole the question that I was grappling with for so long about whether the real life little boy chose to go with his family when Mia arrived and it was going to she was going to answer that. It was it was very clear to me that it was it was going that it was going to be about her decision. I didn't know, interestingly, I didn't know what her decision was going to be until about halfway into the book. I didn't know what she would choose. And I didn't know that um, Adam and the sort of the conflict with him and the love story with him and, and the tug of war she had been playing out in her, her real life with him and music and their futures. I didn't realize that was going to be a part of the story until I wrote that first date. Um, it's one of the really nice things I think about starting a novel is like when you when you open that door and you're like, oh wow, that that's really something. So I wrote that first scene where they they go on that date to the Yo-Yo Ma concert, and I I realized then I'm like, oh wait a second, they are really in love. And then I understood that that created a whole host of complications in her regular life. Um, as much as I love Mia and Adam. From if I stay in where she went, I would be remiss if we neglected Allison and Willem from Just One Day, Just One Year, and Just One Night. Um, you know, because your novels, the, the, uh, If I Stay in Where She Went and the Just One Day, One Year, One Night books are complementary, that, you know, they're not sequels necessarily, that there are stories that overlap or telling. I think, I couldn't help it, that I, this question from Twitter, um, I think, is relevant. Um, it's from uh, at Living Trees on Twitter, I always feel weird saying the Twitter handles. At Living Trees on Twitter asks, "How do you complete a book fully without getting distracted and wanting to write a whole new story?" And the reason why I ask that is because, you know, so how about it? How do you do that? I well, ask. Sometimes at Live in Trees, you do get distracted, and you do write a whole new story. Um, you, the book that I have coming out in, in January of next year is the result of that. I call it my affair book, because just one day and just one year were technically really difficult to write because of how they were so interwoven. And I, I was like, you know, in a tired old, tired old marriage with them, and then there was like this hot, sexy new book that I kept sneaking off and telling, telling nobody about. It felt totally illicit. And so I actually kind of wrote that one on the sly. But back to your question, I think it really is about, it's about being a writer, which is, this is, this is our job, right, Megan? And there's days that your job is great and wonderful, and there's days that your that your job is really lousy, but you have commitments and you have deadlines, and you sit in the chair, and you get your hands on that keyboard, and you do the work. Butt and in chair. Butt, butt and chair, your hands and fingers on keyboard. Yes. Um, you know, there's quite an international cast of characters to keep track of in um, Just One Day, Just One Night, and Just One Year. Um, and yet every person that Allison and William Willem meet are um, are so recognizable, you know. They're th but but they're they're very unique. They're in, they're individual people. Um, so let's hear from Katie and Jackie who, who want to know about characters. These questions these are two questions that sound similar, but in my mind, at least the answers can be quite different. Um, so Katie and Jackie. Uh, what character from all of your books do you feel the most connected with? What character? From all of your books. From all your books. Is do you my feel favorite? The most, no, do you feel the most connected with? And then okay. Jackie's question is, um, what was your favorite character to write? So it's okay. which do you feel most connected with and who was your, most, who was your favorite character to write? Because those, those aren't the same questions. No, they're totally not the same. The character I feel the most connected to is Adam, um, particularly where she went Adam, particularly where she went Adam when he's being kind of whiny and self-pitying and insufferable. And I'm not sure what that says about me, but I, I, really, I really understand that guy. And it's, it's bizarre to me that the character I feel the most connected to is a, a, a man, and I'm not. Um, but but that is who I feel the most connected to. The character who was the most sort of satisfying to write, like Mia was incredibly satisfying to write for a variety of reasons, but um, Dee in Just One Day was both oh, yeah. hard to write 
because I was trying to do something. I was trying to kind of take a stereotype and have this character be somebody who was very aware of all the ways that people perceived him. D is poor, he's black, and he's gay. And he's used to people looking at him and being like, you are this, you are this, you are this. And instead of like resenting it, which I think he probably does, he is smart enough to kind of use people's expectation of who he's going to be to kind of play off of. Yeah. And to use it to his advantage. And to me, he is the smartest character I've ever written. Not like the smartest character, but in terms of if he was a real person, we were going to line everybody up and say, who's the most intelligent, who's going to take over the world? It would be D. I love D. I love D. I mean, and and you're right. It, it was it. It could have been a stereotype, or even just like it could have been the sassy, sassy gay best friend, sassy gay, friend. gay black best friend. You know, snap, snap. You know, and 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 he plays into that when needs be. But he was so multi-dimensional, and then meeting his whole family, and it was like I I love D. Like I was like I want to be friends with D. I can totally see why you'd feel that way about him. Um, so, uh, Dimplesh, again, on Twitter, at Dimplesh on Twitter, but it reminded me, please, let's make sure that we get to ask about the If I Stay movie. We can't run out of time before we talk about the If I Stay movie. Coming out August 22nd. Um, so, we have a question from, from Aaron about the movie. Um, what is the best and worst part about seeing What's the best and worst part about your book made into a film? Um, well, let's start with the worst first. The worst part part is having to give control over to something that is really meaningful to you. And I think that that's hard with any book, or the book that's so personal to you, um, it, it, it is even more so. And so it's why I wanted to stay involved when, when they made it. And I, it's why I feel incredibly blessed that it, that it landed with um, the producer it did, Alison Greenspan, and the director it did, R.J. Cutler, because this, this man feels this book as deeply in his bones as, as anybody who has loved it. And the first time I met him, and it had been, you know, it had been making the rounds for a while and had some, a couple fits and starts, but when I met him, I just knew, I'm like, you, you are the one, you are the right person, this is why it's taking so long, or this long. And, and you're going to make it beautifully. And and I saw the final the final cut a couple of days ago, and and I was right. Um, and the best part about it, and I know there's like lots of people who are just like, oh, you know, movies are never as good as the books. But here's the thing: is that there's some things that a book just can't do. And we talk a lot about the music in If I Stay. And mm -hmm. there's only so much even the most gifted writer, which I am not, can put onto the page to really give you the visceral experience of the music. And the music in this movie is mind-blowing. Both Adam's band and seeing the trajectory of like this band on the rise, it's so electric. And seeing Mia from like a young child playing cellist to her Juilliard audition, which moves me to tears every time I see it. I think that that is something that is just, it was amazing. I got to see a lot of those scenes being shot. And it's an extraordinary thing if you really connected to the music in particular to be able to kind of see and hear that. I think that that is one of my favorite things about um, the adaptation, which I which I'm just I generally think really really works in terms of it being. It brings the feels and the characters and everything that you know. If you love the book, it, it translates that to the screen, which is the oh. most you can have. So is there original um, music that has been created based on the songs that you wrote in the book? There's no songs in If I Stay. Those are in Where She Went, where I, where I wrote the lyrics. Um, right. But yes, there's all these original songs from Adam's band. And the, the, the name of the band has changed from Shooting Star. We had the legal reason, so it's now called Willamette Stone. So Willamette Stone, there's like, you hear four or five songs in there that um, that are original songs. And this is also fantastic. RJ and Allison were, from the get-go, they didn't want actors pretending to be musicians. So Jamie, who plays Adam, he plays guitar, he sings, he's incredible. And the guys and the girl who are in his band, they're actual, they're not actors. They're, they're all musicians. So this is the first movie they've been in. And so they really seem like a band together. And they all, they all, 
sort of fell in love with each other. It was very great to watch. So the music really feels real because it is real. Um, so how are you hand like it's two months away. I'm excited for you. Like I'm really excited about this movie and I'm like I can't even imagine like how you, you're how do you stand it at this point? Like you must be so anxious for people to see it. You know, like I am, and there's like the side of me that's like, wow, this is all happening. And and you know, yesterday I, I went shopping for a dress because like I have to do fancy things, and I'm about to at the end of this at the end of June I go up to a little cabin in the woods for four weeks with my kids. So there'll be right. no shopping then. Um, but then like I come home for the day, and there's like you know I have a six and a nine year old, and you know, I have to take this one to singing lessons, and then this one is the June share, and and she wants to tell me everything she's learned about butterflies, and and they're a little into it, but they really don't care. Like it, right. it's so you know life stays the same in my little world. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and that's I think that's the thing that a lot of people think that I mean, especially when you have a you know, a movie coming out, and which I've never had, but but in general, people tend to think that our lives as writers are, are way more yeah. glamorous yeah. than they really are, especially, you know, and yes, like, uh, you know, I had an awesome night of karaoke with, you know, fantastic <laughs> young adult writers, or there's, there'd be a picture of me at dinner with a group of writers who are, in it. but it's like, that is like 1% of my time, like, right. as a writer, like, we don't see pictures of ourselves doing dishes and packing the lunches and helping with the right. Laundry. It's like nobody, you don't want to see that. Nobody wants yeah. to see that. But really, I mean, that's it's the button share stuff. That yeah. the reason that we're on Twitter all the time is to distract ourselves from the button share stuff. Like right. it's because because we spend our lives alone with the voices in our head. Yeah. And then if you have kids, you know, then you're alone with them. So it it's it's sort of like. Um, this is this is our way to kind of have our little collegial talk, right? So I, I actually got to see you. I, I I didn't introduce myself afterward because there was a throng of people who came after. But I went to I saw you speak at BEA on a panel with with Meg Wolitzer, who I love, and E Lockhart, who I also love, and Jandy Nelson. It was this fantastic panel. We talked about so many great things, but one of the subjects that came out because it's been coming up a lot lately is. Um, the need for diversity in books. And I, I thought you brought up a really great point, which was, you know, when we, when we talk about diversity, so much of the effort, is, uh, effort is, like, is on skin color. That it's like, okay, if you have a person of color in your book, that, that equals diversity. And you were like, well, what do we mean by diversity? And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what diversity means to you and what you think that we need to see more of in, in young adult books and maybe books in general. I mean, I do think that the skin color is a big issue, and I, I don't, I don't mean to minimize that. And you know, one of my daughters, my youngest daughter, is from Ethiopia, and so one of the the issues that we have is when we are looking at picture books and the kind of picture books that she really likes are like the goofy, rompy comedies, like Fancy Nancy, and we had a difficult time finding. Brown Fancy Nancy, you know, the kind of books, that, there was Ezra Jack Keats books, the ones that just kind of show life, so we spent a lot of time reading books about animals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I talked to another author who, who said that they shaded the, the girls in so that they were, they looked like their own children. Um, so that has actually inspired me to, to write a picture book, <laughs> so we'll see where that goes. But I think that, that it is absolutely true, and that we want to kind of see it, I would like to see diversity in books be more fluid as it is both in real life so that it's not always the issue either. So that you can have characters of color and you can have characters of sexuality and you can have characters of different socioeconomic status and sometimes that is part of the plot point but sometimes it's just part of the fabric of life which I think, you know, I live in Brooklyn and increasingly that's what it's like here. So I would like to see it kind of across the board like that. Um, but I also know that there's I see how things get whitewashed. I've had an experience once where I had a, a character who was um, a com was Asian and computer guy, and it was the Pacific Northwest, and somebody's like, was well, that a stereotype? And so we went through all of these different iterations about how to fix that. And I had lived in the Pacific Northwest, and I knew this person. Right. And this person was definitely, he was like a second generation. He could be Chinese or Korean. 
And the fix was either to do something that felt false, like make him African American, which wouldn't be the case, right. or right. To make him white, which is really what the dominant, you know, for if we're talking about in computing, really is. So you kind of there's there's I think we have still it gets to the issue of the discomfort that we have talking about race in general because everybody's scared of being called a racist. And then yeah. I think there's authors that maybe want to go there but are scared that they don't have the right to or that they'll do it right. wrong. So I think it's really great that we're having this conversation. But what came up too, and I'm stealing this from Emily Lockhart, which is that she said, like, I think we also need to examine what we mean by diversity and, and note that it is actually there in a lot more books than we think. Right. I remember, I mean, when I was writing Sloppy First, I remember being really torn because I, I wanted to write about this suburban high school experience that, that was very explicitly not a diverse community. Like, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and part of Jessica's critique on her high school is the fact that it is so homogenous. Yeah, yeah. Because I figured, you know, for me to inject, you know, like, and that's why and she even jokes like Percy is her token black friend, you know. I mean, you know, to play to make a joke out of this very serious issue was the a way how was the only way that I felt comfortable addressing it in to depict this experience authentically as I wanted that's, to do. That's the key right there is the authenticity. It's like a way to do it, and you have her you have her noting the fact that this is and so it's done in an authentic way. I think readers we know when we're when we're sort of trying to shoehorn something in. And I think readers smell it too, but I think that because it's the world we increasingly live in, that it's it's a matter of trying to kind of find ways to to weave it in authentically. So we really we're running out of time. We're actually technically out of time. But can you talk a little bit about your next book that's coming out in January, or are you it's part where it's still quite private? No, I think um, it's called I Was Here, and it's uh, it's a standalone, and it's about a girl named Cody. And it opens about a month after her best friend has killed herself by drinking a, a bottle of industrial poison in a motel room. Um, and it's, it's a mystery. She finds these encoded messages on, on her friend's computer that she inherits. And it kind of leads her down this very dark road. And she discovers that her friend was involved in a group that, um, sort of a suicide support group that, that helped her kill herself. And it's really about Cody's quest to kind of find somebody to blame this on. But she's really just looking for a way to to understand what's happened and to find because she's blaming herself. So it's it's really a book about forgiveness and there's a very hot guy in it. <laughs> Girls from Central, don't you want to read that book now? Like I want to read it now. Like I, I, I it's, it's out January. That's so oh wow. And I know it's gonna be it's gonna be beautiful like all your other books. Gail Oh our time is up. It's just it's always so upsetting. Um, We're really getting together to talk why I'm sassy 17 and go karaoke. This is a oh dumb thing. And, and, and Todd Sparrow. Todd Sparrow. So remember, ladies and everybody watching, if I stay, hits theaters August 22nd. Let's prove that The Fault in Our Stars was not a fluke. Okay, so Girls mark it on your power. Account. Girls have power at the box office. You have, power. you have the power to start putting more of what you want to see on screens and on shelves. So take that power and, well, it's, it's the power of the pocketbook, basically. It's the power of money. So use your, spend your money on, on good stuff like that. <laughs> uh, also, mark your calendars for Tuesday, July 29th, um, where I will be back for my next episode of Ask Authors Anything. My co-host will be from John Witherspoon Middle School in Princeton, New Jersey. And we will be talking to Newberry award-winning author of When You Reach Me, Rebecca Stead, who is, that's a book that I finished reading it, and I went right back to the beginning to read it all over again to figure out how she did what she did. And right? So, right. So, so until then, keep turning the pages or swiping the screen, however, or what, whatever and however you read, just keep on reading because readers like you are why Gail and I do what we do. So thank you so much for joining us, and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, girls. Thank you.